a wooden match doesn't reveal light or warmth until it strikes against the surface. I think our gifts are like that, and they don't reveal themselves until they strike against the needs of the world. Mark Nepo. Mark Nepo. Mark Nepo. Mark Nepo is the number one New York Times bestselling author, a poet, teacher, and storyteller. He's published 25 books, been called one of the finest spiritual guides of our time, and has appeared several times on Oprah's Super Soul Sunday, speaking about his work, The Journey of Inner Transformation. Oprah was such a blessing, a lightning strike. She took me aside and she said, this is your time. Don't leave anything unsaid that's on your heart. What would you offer as guidance for somebody who's searching for their purpose? Our purpose is to be as alive as possible. And if we can follow our heart, that will lead us to our gifts. The Icons is a show where we learn life lessons from those who've had iconic impact. And today I have the honor of having a conversation with someone I've been listening to from afar for years. Great love and great suffering are the great teachers. Love is a way of life when we keep giving and keep caring. Every generation is a challenging time, but every generation it's our turn. Are we going to choose love over fear? Mark Nepo, welcome to the Icons by Motiversity. Oh, thank you so much. It's a joy to be with you. Now, Mark, you just released a book called Falling Down, Getting Up, and this is a topic we touch on a lot in motivation. What have you learned about falling down and getting up? One of the things I've, I've learned is that, you know, of course, no one wants to fall down. Uh, but like gravity, <laughs> we can't avoid it. And what I've discovered in my life is that if we back up enough, actually falling down and getting up is a rhythm. And actually over a lifetime, it's actually a dance. So as much as we don't like to fall down, how, what, what is the art of that dance? What are the skills? How do we, how do we help each other? You know, the, the title of the book came from, uh, in medieval times, medieval monks, when asked how they practiced their faith, said by falling down and getting up. And I learned that in other traditions, they're similar. You know, in, ja in Japan, there's a proverb that says, fall down seven, get up eight. And it made me think quickly of, you know, I'm 72, but in my 30s, I almost died from a rare form of lymphoma. And one part of that journey, I had a rib removed from my back, and I, I woke up afterwards and uh, quite <laughs> dislocated. Um, and this kind but gruff nurse was right there in my face saying, okay, get up, we're going to walk. <laughs> I thought, Who, who's going to walk? Um, and then she leaned closer and whispered softly, two steps forward, one step back, falling down, getting up. And as I researched the book, you know, I ran across in the Hindu Upanishads, which are the anonymous sacred texts in the Hindu tradition, and they're just filled with amazing metaphors. And one of them I discovered is that of a caterpillar. And they say, you know, how a caterpillar will bunch up and then move forward and bunch up at two steps forward, one step back. And they use that image in the Upanishads to say, this is the pace of spiritual growth. It's not a straight line. And we also, you know, you could say in another, uh, William Blake in his wonderful Proverbs, he has a proverb that says, straight is the road to improvement, but crooked is the road to genius. Wow. It, it, you know, I had the chance to read the opening of your book and I was captured by the idea that this has been somewhat universal and timeless, this concept. And I was curious why you chose to write about falling down and getting up now. Well, given, given our, and, and let me back up and say that, you know, we live in very challenging times, but I would say every generation is a challenging time. The details are different. But every generation, it's our turn. Are we going to choose love over fear? Are we going to lean in or pull away? You know, are, are we going to ask questions or <clears throat> keep uh, making declarations out of fear? So one of the things that my publisher, Joel Fotinos in, uh, for St. Martin's, and he, we have a wonderful creative partnership. And the trigger for this book um, was that he kept noticing that, you know, I have a pretty active teaching schedule because I just love being in this space we're in. And that's so growthful for me. 
And he said, I've noticed that, you know, you teach so much. And, and he kept asking me about it. And then he said, well, if someone couldn't be in one of your circles, what book would be the closest to that experience? What, what an invitation. So, so that's that coupled with my own experience of this, this kind of inescapable skill we're asked to learn and personalize. There are no how-tos. We can discuss it, but then ultimately we each have to personalize what this means. That led to the birth of this book. You know, as you mentioned, every generation has, has, has had their time to take on hard problems. I think it's an important piece. You know, it's probably pretty fair to say that every generation's taken on just about the most complex thing the world had ever seen, and, and now it's our turn. And, and I think about, you know, I mentioned in the intro that, you know, I've been listening to you from afar for, for years. And when I think about some of your kind of public rise, you wrote the Book of Awakening in 2000. And then 10 years later, it was kind of noticed and noted by Oprah. And it, and it had your kind of public profile rise. And that book did extraordinary things. And it's an extraordinary book. Uh, what did you learn about yourself in that process by having a book that you'd written 10 years earlier all of a sudden rise to number one on the New York bestselling list? Well, it was so interesting. And I think I learned this after almost dying. Of course, you know, there, there is a, and, and this kind of dovetails with, with what we might discuss with younger people. And that is, I learned very deeply and quickly um, after almost dying that it's giving attention that brings us alive. It's giving attention, recognizing and verifying life that highlights our connection and, and shows us that we're more together than alone, which is a title of another of my books. And, but in the world, the external world, we're obsessed and over uh, indoctrinated with getting attention. So of course, in the surface world, we have to do that. We apply for a job. I have to give you a resume so that you can see who I am and if we might. So there, there's nothing wrong with getting attention, but what brings us alive is giving attention. So we live, especially in the modern era, we live in a place where that the we have a miseducation. We think that getting attention will verify our worth. No. It's giving attention that restores our worth, enhances our growth, solidifies our connection. And, and often we, we, you know, miss, they, they get twisted. So, you know, what I learned, I mean, Oprah was such a blessing. Um, you, you know, it's just like a, a lightning strike. You, <laughs> you know, come. And um, it was a wonderful, uh, she's amazingly authentic and an amazing bridger. And, uh, and, and, and she echoes this as well. You know, one of my interviews with her on, on Super Soul Sunday, the, we had everything all set up and uh, the cameras and whatnot. And, and before we started, you know, she took me aside and she said, this is your time. Don't leave anything unsaid that's on your heart. And that echoes very much my commitment when I'm teaching, when I'm holding space. And I believed her. And, and so I feel like our interviews have been conversations like we're having. They weren't like, oh, here's an interview, you know. And actually, the word interview originally comes from the French, entre vous, and it means to, to look between. So it's the space that opens in between. So, so, so you know, I would say what I learned, um, you know, like any artist or writer, um, when we're not recognized or we struggle on that end, the obstacle or the challenge, if you will, is to never stop believing in your vision. You know, because there's echoes of, gee, nobody's hearing me. Does this really matter? And so I, I've been blessed to go through that experience earlier in my career, of course. We all start that way. And I've been blessed to have this amazing, um, you know, spotlight from Oprah that went all over the world like in 24 hours. 
like unbelievable. And, um, but then I learned that on the other side, when you are blessed to have some kind of recognition, well, then the challenge shifts to, are you being misheard or misunderstood or projected on or, you know, and, and I, I've learned that as grateful as I am for it all, n- neither side, not being seen or being seen, really doesn't have anything to do with the work. We keep working. So a metaphor that I've come to understand about it is, um, you know, if you're walking into a strong wind, well, you got to really like plant your feet, lean forward and keep going. Well, if you're blessed to have the wind at your back, you do the same thing. You just lean in the other direction and keep working. That idea of giving attention and getting attention, I think that's, I think a lot of people heard that, want to hear that, need to hear that. I think that's really powerful. And to, you know, think about that moment in your life, you gave your attention fully to this book and then 10 years later, got a lot of attention for it. But the work and the attention are, are independent pieces. It, 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 it's kind of a grounding principle that you can kind of really give yourself to something and, and feel like that, that equals the intention, that equals the work. And, and not to take anything away from getting attention, but just to recognize the independence. Well, and this this dovetails with the speed of our age, because what's inherent in what we're talking about is that, thankfully, things that matter still take time. Now, I don't want to give up technology. Technology is a wonderful thing. Look at us. We're, you know, a continent away almost, and here we are. Um, But one of the things that we, in our modern world, is we have to recognize the cost of progress, not give up progress. So, for instance, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, you know, my grandfather probably, you know, had to cut wood and start a fire and literally hunt and gather and, you know, well, we don't, you know, we don't have to do that, thankfully. So we've had to, so a lot of, there were no, there was no need back then for yoga and gyms and exercise because it was built into surviving. So great, we don't want to do that. So we do that. So there are physical aerobics. Well, now you go 150 years later, and now we're faced with creating and practicing spiritual aerobics to compensate for the cost of progress. So an example would be my father, who didn't travel much in his life, um, but we subscribed to National Geographic, and he loved to look at the pictures, you know. Well, now in my life, I get to travel, but you know, like for instance, I'm never going to climb Mount Everest, but I can go on YouTube and I can literally be on someone's shoulder as they're climbing Mount Everest. Well, that's a wonderful thing. However, one of the things that gets muddled in our modern age is there are so many of us that will watch that video and think we've made the climb. No, we didn't make the climb. It's wonderful to see it. There is things that are lost spiritually for not making whatever the climb is yourself. And so this is the path of of the inner work, of the relational work. So this is one of the difficult things and costs of all the social media and all of our devices. You know, we we think that when we're on a device, we're connecting. Well, we're connecting in a way that can happen, but that sets the ground for you and I being in person together. We didn't make, we made a climb, but we didn't make the climb. And likewise, we can think we're alone on our devices and we're not really alone either. We're kind of in a digital nether world. So we don't get the true benefit of relationship And I'm saying, let's not get rid of the devices, but realize they are a conduit to more relationship, both with ourselves and with each other. So we're not really getting the real rewards of relationship, and we're also not getting the real rewards of solitude. You know, Rilke, the great poet, he has a line in one of his poems. He said, 
I am alone, but not alone enough to make every moment holy. So we need to think about how do we compensate for these illusions? You know, we were, and this is not to, I don't, I mean, I don't want to be critical of any particular reality show, but, you know, just the, the whole notion of it, take like American Idol or any one of those things. That's fine. It's fun. But if I'm lonely and having trouble connecting and I go tune in and I think that I'm, have, I'm in relationship, I even get to vote, and I expend all my relational energy, then I turn off the TV, and I'm still alone. So it's fine as entertainment, but it doesn't replace true relationship. And so these are the kind of spiritual aerobics we have to be aware of so we don't disappear in our progress. When you mentioned the things that matter still take time. I, I was captured by that. You know, you, you describe a lot of what our viewers and our fans' relationship is with us. In one way, they've got this ability to turn on YouTube, have this quick connection, feel a relationship. But in the same respect, one of the questions we get all, all the time is, but I'm still searching for my purpose. So although I can watch a video on Everest, that's very different than climbing Everest. And there's a lot of, of uncertainty around in this speed of change in this modern world where it feels like there's so much pressure to announce this purpose and to have this kind of guiding light. What would you offer as guidance for somebody who's searching for their purpose? Yeah. So um, let me quickly tell a parable and then I'll move into that because it has to do with what we're talking about. And this is a, an old parable about a, uh, a master and apprentice. The master tells his student, I want you to sit by the river until you've learned all the river has to teach you. So he's a very serious student. So he takes his robes and his chimes and his pillow, and he goes near the river, and he spends the whole first day figuring out where's the best place to sit. So he does, he finally sits midway under a willow tree and he goes into serious meditation. And after three days, nothing. I mean, he just has a terrible headache. And just as his head is pounding and he's wondering, why did my master send me to do this? Out of the bushes on the other side, out of nowhere, a monkey comes and jumps in the river, splashing and yapping. Ah! And it cracks the apprentice, he starts to weep. And he gathers his things. He goes back to his teacher. He tells him what happened. And his teacher puts his arm around him and he says, Ah, the monkey heard. You just listened. The monkey heard. You just listened. And I think the import of that story is curiosity is not a substitute for wonder. There's, there's nothing wrong with watching. We can learn by watching. There's nothing wrong with our devices but only if it leads to getting wet. Life is about jumping in the river. So now as we move to what, what we might discuss, and I don't have, you know, I like to say that what I share are examples, not instructions, uh, but we can talk about these things. And, and from my experience, I would offer that our purpose, our true purpose is to be as alive as possible. And if we can follow our heart, that will lead us to our gifts. And once we have a sense of our gifts, we can start to discover how to best use them. How to best use them. Again, the same way we, that we rush to getting attention, we rush to thinking our purpose is, you know, that I'm, I'm going to jump to being this particular activity and become great at it and do all okay. But first I would offer, we have to know ourselves and our gifts. So, you know, there's a, and, and that requires holding nothing back, opening our heart and asking as many questions as possible. And there's a, uh, there's a medieval, medieval mystic, Mechtild, she was from Germany, female mystic. She had this wonderful image. She said, a bird doesn't fall from the sky and a fish doesn't drown in water. Each of God's creatures must find their God-given element. So it's easy for a bird 
or a fish. It's pretty clear. But we as a spirit in a body and time on earth, we have, we're like multifaceted prism. We have so many gifts that it's not as simple as a bird or a fish. The first thing we have to do is know ourselves, know our gifts so we can see where they can be of best use. And, and this leads to, let me quote another a sage, and this is Ramana Maharshi from the uh, Hindu sage from the 1800s. He was an amazing man. And, um, and he said, before trying to save the world, you must first liberate yourself. To try to save the world without first liberating yourself is like carpeting the earth rather than wearing sandals. So this, you know, we, we often jump, even meaning well, it, this is the inextricable link between inner work and service. Wow. You know, as you speak about the, the bird and the fish and, and that in lots of ways, because they're, they're contained or they have a, an environment that they thrive in, it's quite clear how to proceed. Whereas for us, when there's so much potential, so much that we could achieve, a lot of people start to chase that achievement. And, and I've heard you touch a little bit on the importance of knowing the difference between what we want and what we're given. Why do you think that those two concepts are so important to understand? I think that what we want and what we're given uh, often serve two different gods. And, and again, in our, our a, our modern age, which suffers from this modern psychological disease we call narcissism, <laughs> you know, um, we tend to think that, uh, I think it's a distortion of our inalienable rights. We think we're entitled to happiness. We're entitled to get what we want. And, I've, and there's nothing wrong with working for what we want. Um, but I've discovered in my life, at least, that, and, and there are, let me just say, you know, there are things we want that aren't frivolous, you know, like I don't want my wife to die, you know, um, but that I want a new car, well, you know, that's not, that's not quite the same category. So I think that one of the, I found in my life that working for what I want has often turned out to be an apprenticeship for working with what I'm given, which is where my true gifts have always shown up. So again, not to say we shouldn't work for what we want. And, and, I, and there are some stories that's, that speak to this. Um, one, let me, let me share one brief, brief story, and this is about a, a professional cyclist, like a Tour de France cyclist, and he is preparing for a race. He's really, he's got the state of the art equipment. He's shaved all the hair off his body. So there's no resistance and he's working his tail off. And the day, the first stage of the race comes and they're off. And after about a mile or two, it's out in the country. He is so far ahead in the beginning of all the other racers that as he crests over a hill, you briefly, you can't even see the other racers. And as he's coasting speedily down this hill, as he reaches the bottom out of nowhere, a great blue heron with its wings spread swoops over his handlebars. Well, it, it stuns him because the heron has opened something he's been chasing. So he stops. He actually, in the middle of the race, he straddles his bike. The other racers are catching up. Now we cut ahead, years ahead. And if you catch him behind his home staring into the woods, and you ask him, what cost you the race? Once in a while, he'll say to you, I didn't lose the race. I left it. Now, someone can hear that story and say, oh, that's all very poetic. He actually lost. He didn't come in first. But I hold it differently. Uh, you know, I think he trained to meet the heron, which changed his life. But if you told him he was training to meet a heron, he wouldn't have trained. So we often work toward what we can see and what's in view, often preparing for something we have no idea is waiting us, is ahead of us. I think this is one of the hard things 
in terms of giving attention and not getting attention and asking questions. Um, you know, th this brings up another misunderstanding in our culture. And I'll pause there. Is that you know we think of self confidence in our culture as certainty and you know standing with bravado or or uh, but actually the word confidence comes from the latin fidere which means fidelity so self confidence more deeply is actually a fidelity to the journey of the true self it's not about certainty it's about being faithful to the journey of your true self, wherever it might take you. Wow. And that has more to do with discovering purpose than planning to become great at something. Discovering purpose. You know, I think, I think there'd be so many people who want that, hear that, and, and have that understanding within them now. I, I'm, I'm willing to give up the race or I've, I've encountered the heron or I've discovered something that's in that moment of transformation, but I, I really don't know where to go next to find my true self, to find my true gifts. You brought up the power of questions a couple of times. Is, is questions the place people start? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the, we also have a misunderstanding about questions uh, in our culture. And, and so you know, in the outer world of circumstance, questions have an answer. What do we have to do to turn on this technology? You know, we, you go down the grocery aisle, which items are cleaning items that you don't want to eat and which are food? So there are answers. But in the inner world and in the world of relationship, questions don't have answers. Questions open relationships. We ask a question the way we'd like to open a door we'd like to walk through with someone. We ask a question like we would throw a log on a fire to keep us warm and to show us the way. You know, there's a line in the Talmud that says, why ruin a perfectly good question with an answer? <laughs> So questions really, and, and this affects, I think, our world at large, you know, the stridency and the polarity in our modern world glo globally right now. You know, um, uh, one of the practices I do when I feel strongly about something, before I voice it, I turn it into a question and be with it. Even a relational thing. Say we, you know, we're friends and, you know, we, something happens and I feel like you've hurt me and I might want to say, you're mean. Well, are you mean? I need to turn it into a question and be with it before I make a pronouncement. And this is one of the ways that the speed of our age is causing a lot of pain and havoc because of the immediacy that we can respond without reflecting. People are, are you know, not turning things into questions and prematurely voicing incredibly strong opinions uh, and furthering hurt without being reflective. You know, and I think what that causes in our world today is, you know, in we mistake intensity for meaning. Just because things are intense doesn't mean they have meaning. So the further I get away from giving attention and just getting attention, well, now I, you know, we are in, we are, I think, in some ways, addicted to intensity, which actually is a distraction from discovering purpose and meaning. So yes, I think we have to ask questions. And one question that I often ask myself um, over the years, in, in personal inquiry and in relational and in, you know in working, is because often things seem complicated. Well, I try to always ask this question: Is what's before me heartening and life giving, or disheartening and life draining? Even if it's difficult, if it's life-giving and heartening, then I'm, I'm in. But if what I'm looking at 
is disheartening and life draining, what am, what am I doing there? And, and that kind of barometer, emotional barometer, has always helped me, especially when things seem complicated. That kind of brings it back to very simple. Is this life-giving or life-draining? As you mentioned that, I, I think about two words I've heard you teach on pain and fear. And I think as soon as we hear those words, we, have kind of an, we all have an immediate reaction to them. And sometimes one of the things that comes with pain and fear is, do I keep going? Is this life-giving? Or, or is this where I retreat? Is this life draining? Or, or how do I make sense of these words? But a lot of people are feeling pretty caught in those words right now. What would you offer for people feeling caught in fear and pain? So first, first off, uh, uh, you know, immense compassion for ourselves and each other because um, it's understandable that we, just like we can't escape gravity, we can't escape pain and fear. In some ways, my going through cancer gave me a lens where I've started to understand that suffering, which is not optional in being a lot, it's not the only thing, but it's a great teacher and a doorway. Great love and great suffering are the great teachers. I think suffering for humans is what erosion is for nature. And there's a paradox that it seems our life journey, like it or not, is that everything that can break will until all that's left is unbreakable. Now, this isn't always fun, and we can't always do it alone. And I think that life has been made just difficult enough that we need each other to ensure the journey of love. So let's go back to fear and pain. So fear and pain, uh, they do have legitimate purposes. They are there to alert us of danger and places that need repair. Now, being human, you know, um, of course, we do this all the time. I do it. Once we feel pain or fear, we tend to inflate what we're going through. And so now we make the fear bigger. Now we make the pain bigger. And of course, fear gets a lot of its power from the future. Like, oh, I, I broke my arm. And what if it doesn't heal? Oh my God, now it's gonna, I'm going to have to live like this forever. And so, and it's totally human to try things on. But what I've discovered is that while we, may, while we need to do that, all things are possible, but none are yet true. So I can, you know, I, when I had cancer, my God, there's a thousand what ifs. And I had to try, what if this, what if that, what if I die, what if I am, you know, debilitated, what if I can't walk, what, you know. But then I've learned over time, one part of the spiritual practice is then come back to what we do know. Come back to this moment, even if it's painful, because what, all things are true, but and possible, but none have yet happened. So I think there's a lot we could we could delve into around pain and fear. I think that, and, and there's one parable I'll tell that that really it's an ancient one, an ancient Hindu one, anonymous. I love these ancient anonymous stories and because pain and fear, the way they say hello, they they make us tense, but we don't have to stay that way. So this parable speaks about this. So in this parable, there's a master and apprentice always. And in this parable, the master finds his apprentice very annoying because all he does is complain, complain, complain. So he says to the apprentice, he says to the apprentice, um, I want you to get a handful of salt, put it in a glass of water and bring it to me quietly. The apprentice does it. The master says, drink. He drinks from the glass. He spits it out. The master says, what's the matter? He said, it's bitter. The master looks at the apprentice. He says, I want you to get the same exact handful of salt and follow me quietly. So the apprentice gets it, and he follows the master who leads him to a lake. The master says, put the salt in the lake. He does. He says, now drink. The apprentice kneels. He scoops the water. It dribbles down his chin. The master says, well, he says, oh, it's fresh. The master looks at the apprentice. He says, stop being a glass, become a lake. 
Stop being a glass, become a lake. Ancient anonymous story. And what this story holds, why I tell it, what it holds for me is that it tells us the challenge and how to deal with fear and pain. The fear and pain are like the salt. No one gets out of this life without their handful of salt. It's just part of the deal. So while fear and pain, and you may hear the story and say, well, it's not good to be a glass. I won't do that. Oh, yes, you will. And so will I, because we're human and that's how fear and pain say hello. But the, the invitation is to say, okay, the only thing to do, we can't eliminate fear and pain, but we can right size it. And we do that by enlarging our sense of things when in fear and pain. So the question, the practice question for all of us is what relationships, what experiences, what practices will let us enlarge our sense of things the next time fear and pain say hello? What's in your toolbox so every time you're surprised by fear and pain, you don't have to start over? What do I need? What do you do? Do you go for a walk in nature? Do you read that one poem that opens your heart? Do you listen to that piece of music that unravels everything? Do you have to call up your oldest friend? Do you make that favorite meal? What do you do? What's in your toolbox to enlarge your sense of things once pain and fear make us a glass? And so this is a good example that, that there are no how-tos, but we, the whole spiritual journey and, and exploring it together is about identifying these life choice points, and then we each have to uh, inhabit them, personalize them, and share notes. Just, I, I could feel my body reacting to that story as you talk about those two powerful words, fear and pain, and that we can clench up when they're connected to us. And, and we can't remove them, but we can right-size them, as you say, I found, and, and, and to open ourselves to that. And it makes me think about a, a third powerful word that you teach on, love. What is love? Oh, Love for me is the, uh, so look, so let's back up. So spirit, <clears throat> uh, what we carry in us is a portion of universal spirit. And that comes alive and animates in us. And love is the way it comes from in, from the mystery into us and into the world. I think the soul which is a portion, that's what we call the portion of universal spirit. Other traditions call it Dharma, Atman, all kinds of things, Holy Ghost, whatever, you know, but, but that portion of spirit in us, again, it simply wants to be as alive as possible. So I think the way we put wood on a fire, we pour care on the soul. And I don't think the soul cares what we care about as long as we care. And this is where giving and loving, not only does it help our relationship, but it is the kind of uh, a prerequisite to feeling our kinship with all things. It's not by accident that the word kinship and kind have the same root. Whenever we're kind, we, uh, we experience our kinship with everything. And so, you know, love Love is a kind of a, a way of life when we keep giving and keep caring. And we grow through doing that. You know, one of my small poems, uh, it's just a few lines. It goes, the mystery is that whoever shows up when we dare to give has exactly what we need hidden in their trouble. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've uh, gone to give and help and trip and discover I'm the one who needs help. <laughs> it, it makes me think a little bit about, you were talking about finding ways to kind of open yourself and that's where, you know, you can in lots of ways find your true gifts and it brings up this idea that we, we have these true gifts and it does re require an opening and sometimes those openings come 
when you're expecting a, you know, a different path to emerge. How do we find our gifts and how do we use our gifts to navigate the world? Well, and I think that, and I can speak to that. I think, you know, another image that I helps that, that I use when speaking about gifts is that, you know, like a wooden match. So we all know that the flame is dormant in the tip of that match and it doesn't reveal light or warmth until it strikes against the surface. Well, I think our gifts are like that and they don't reveal themselves until they strike against the needs of the world. And so, you know, I might, you know, there's, a, there's a, also a great story about a guy who, um, he, wa- he, he really wants to be a philanthropist, but he doesn't have any money, but he, he'd, so he'd like to work for a philanthropy place. So he, he puts his resume in, he, and he has an interview set up. And on the way to the interview, um, as he's crossing the street to this big, big building in New York, uh, this woman, fall, older woman falls down, skins her knee, he helps her up and she's not, you know, she needs help. He, he winds up taking her to the emergency room and he misses his interview. So he reschedules the appointment. Next time he's on his way to the appointment and as he's crossing a park now to get, all of a sudden a dog runs loose in front of him. And soon after a little six-year-old's running after the dog and then there's a father trying to catch the six-year-old and there's all this traffic. So he winds up, he winds up, helping the girl and the father, getting the dog, and he misses the interview again. Well, you know, the, the organization says, well, you're irresponsible. We're not even going to give you an interview. You can't keep an interview. Forget it. And then he, you know, sits on the bench and he says, gee, I wish I could be of help. If I could only be of help. And so again, following our heart, following our heart wherever it leads. And there's another thing about love and giving that I've learned, and that is that the mind can only take us so far. It's a great tool, an amazing tool, as, we, as far as we know, unlike any other creatures. And that's our gift and our curse. And, and you know, I... One of the things that happened to me during my cancer journey was before my cancer journey, I was way up in my head too much. And not through any wisdom on my part, but afterwards, my, my, it all dropped down here. And ever since, my mind has served my heart and not the other way around. And so one of the things I've learned is, you know, I, I, I value the mind. I'm grateful for my mind. But I've discovered quite by accident that when I can't penetrate things or solve things with my mind, if I give, I see differently. Other things come on the scene. And I learned this quite by accident because I was struggling with something. I can't remember what it is now. But And right at that time, a friend needed me, called me up. I dropped everything, went to help them. And after giving... Uh, things were a lot more clear because I had engaged my heart. So there were lots of rewards. Not only can giving clear our mind, giving can enhance and loving can enhance our relationship and give us access to our kinship with all things. That's how powerful the conduit of care and loving is, and so that allows us not to write our story, but to live our story. You know, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, can't quote it exactly, but he had this wonderful uh, notion that he said, you know, every person's problems or questions are waiting in what they're about to experience, like a hieroglyphic to be decoded. We first live it before we apprehend it as truth. And so it's almost as if every person has their own language of wisdom that we discover a word at a time through an experience at a time, which gets us back to things that matter take time. So 
One other image to counter the speed of our age is, you know, before we had cell phones that take these amazing pictures, you can just hold the button, you get 20 pictures in 10 seconds. But of course, we know that in the beginning of photography, you know, Ansel Adams carried a tripod and a plate. One, one film was like, the, you know, and, and he'd carry that into the mountains and wait, say, God, I hope I get the right shot. But then he'd have to take it back. And I think probably there might be a whole generation that doesn't realize that there were things called dark rooms where he would take that plate, that image, put it in chemicals in a dark room and wait. And after a while, the image would appear. Well, this is a great image for how insight and wisdom develop in our heart and our mind. We live it, and now we have to wait for the insight to appear. And being so impatient and having our impatience augmented by the speed of our age, we often leave the dark room just before the image insight appeared. We go, well, nothing's there, the hell with this, and we slam the door, and just as we leave, <laughs> the insight appears. As you describe that that match and that, you know, the opportunity for your, your gifts to strike against the needs of the wor world and and and, and it, you know, we talk about falling down and, and maybe that's the strike before you get up, or or cancer can be the strike, or fear or pain or love. It feels like being open to that whatever it is that creates that, that moment, um, that really struck me. Yeah, absolutely. And let me also just offer that while, while that it doesn't have to be just something that's difficult or suffering, you know, often those things get our attention most quickly and they are transformative. I mean, I, I speak about cancer cause that was the catalyst for me, but it could be beauty, joy, wonder, surprise, being loved unconditionally for the first time. Uh, you know, it could be everyone, one of the archetypal passages, everyone will be given the chance to be dropped into the depth of life. And how we meet that, that depth is when our journey truly begin. This idea of growth and how we grow as humans, I think is so central and really um, sought right now by so many people. And I've heard you describe that two of the ways that we grow is by being broken open or willfully shedding. What do you see in, in those, in those pursuits that are helpful for people. Yeah, so the, this is like spiritual physics, I think. So two of the ways that I do, th or I've experienced, that we do tend to grow is by willfully shedding, as you, as you just said, being willing to take off masks and roles, and as we discover new ways, we, we shed them. We shed things, which doesn't mean that there have been falls. You know, after all, when a butterfly emerges from a cocoon, it doesn't mean the cocoon was false. It means it served its purpose. And so in that way, one self can give birth to the next self. And the other way is that we are broken open. Now, this is not to say that every time we break, it's a wonderful thing. Let's reframe it. No, sometimes we just break. And sometimes we break open. And the important thing is that we take turns. So when I break open, I can help you if you, are, if you are break. And then we'll take turns. And next week, I'll break and you'll break open and you, you can help me. So it's not to say, you know, to put a, a, a pretty face on difficulty all the time. But it does tend to seem that we are broken open when we resist. You know, when we resist. And that when we can, and we, you know, we can also willfully say, oh, wow, this isn't working. I need to put it down. And, and this brings us to a, um, uh, I'm very interested in word origins. Um, not because I'm a word geek, 
but because I have learned that, that words erode over time. And so often when we go back, if we can, the more original definitions are more whole and more helpful. And one of the words is sacrifice. So we know sacrifice, its modern meaning is, you know, so many people, health workers, sacrificed during the pandemic. We were so indebted to them for the common good. You know, we often see throughout history, you know, soldiers sacrifice for, for countries, even their lives. And that grows out of a deeper soil where the original definition of the word sacrifice is very profound. It means putting down what no longer works in order to stay close to what is sacred. Wow. Wow putting down what no longer works in order to stay close to what is sacred. Every one of us experiences this in our lives, in our relationships, in the way countries proceed. And one of the uh, important things is it's why it's hard to put down what once worked is because It's dear to us, but we need to put it down to keep growing. What's sacred never changes, but we change. So I'll give you two examples, one a personal example and then one of another parable. So a personal example is, you know, I grew up in a pretty dysfunctional, my parents are both gone now, but in a pretty, you know, dysfunctional household, it was difficult was painful. I was kind of like the sensitive one and was always the the butt of poking and prodding. So, you know, as a teenager, I I developed what I called my catcher's mitt. You know, like I could be surprised by nothing but hurt by everything. Well, that became so reflexive that by the time I was in my 30s and I went through my cancer journey, well, I didn't survive not to be touched by life. And this thing had a mind of its own. So I had to spend a long time putting down this reflex so that I could be touched by life. And the stronger that I am in my own, this comes from, again, we'll weave things together, giving attention strengthens our foundation. And so then I was better able to withstand the hurt. And so out of that, I developed a belief that I'd rather be fooled than not believe. I can get hurt, but I'll survive it. But that's more important than not being touched by life. So the parable is a story from the life of Buddha. Buddha was, you know, he would walk from town to town and there wasn't CNN, so there were no cameras or anything, you know. Often alone, a lot of people didn't know who he was. And he was walking from one town to the other and he came to a very fast and deep river. And uh, it was, there were no boats, there were no docks. And it was a little too fast and deep to, he didn't trust he could swim or wade across. So he spent a day building a raft out of w- reeds and branches. And sure enough, it held him. He got across and he, he shook it out and he started walking and he put the raft on his back. And after about an hour or two, he realized he no longer smelled water. And he thought, I don't think there are any more rivers to cross. Why am I carrying this raft on my back? And so the the beauty of Buddha's response is he stopped, spent the night, built a fire, and did a ritual in which he thanked the raft and burned it, saying, I'd rather burn you in reverence than carry you on my back in resentment. Now, you know, someone could say, well, He could have left the raft with a sign, free raft, or given it to goodwill. But that's another story. This, the point of this story is I putting down what no longer works with gratitude in order to stay close to what is sacred. Do you you remember the classic movie, The Deer Hunter, back in in the the seventies or something or eighty early? So now there was a a story, an example, this, the main character, which has so often happened in history, 
in order to survive war, he had to dehumanize himself. And he did survive. And then when he came back to live, he couldn't put down what no longer worked. And he couldn't live because he was fixated on the ways he had to be in order to survive war. And he couldn't put down what no longer worked. And therefore, he couldn't stay close to what is sacred. So, Mark, when we put down the thing that no longer works, what's the difference between surrender and acceptance of that? Yeah, so, so surrender is a word that's misunderstood. Surrender, to me, doesn't mean giving up. It doesn't mean resignation. I think I've come to understand that to surrender is to cooperate with truth. And this requires us, there's a great Buddhist practice, which is very simple but very hard, and that is to see things as they are. When we can see things as they are, we have a better chance of cooperating with truth. And that ties in acceptance. So we need to first accept that something's no longer working. So we see that, oh, I do need to put this down. I do need to discover a new way to be. And so, you know, in the, in the Taoist tradition, and the Tao simply means the way, the early, this early Chinese, uh, wonderful, I love that kind of worldview. And their image is that, you know, the life is like an invisible river. There are all these currents, and every soul is like a fish in that river. And the purpose of our will is not to conquer the river, it's to find the currents so they can take you. That's kind of, I think, what it is to surrender and cooperate with truth. So, you know, this is the difference between pushing and tending. You know, when I insist on something uh, too much, I'm pushing against the current of life rather than asking, where is this current, you know, taking me? Am I, am I, you know, rejecting the heron that's come in my path? Am I insisting on carrying the raft? You know, this is where fear can take over. Well, I don't smell any water, but just in case, I'm going to carry this raft everywhere I go. And then it's twice as hard to go anywhere. And then I start to resent the raft. But what's making me carry it? My fear. So surrender is how do we give up and right-size the fear. So all these things we've been talking about, they all go together in, in how do we uh, inhabit a personal spiritual practice that helps us live in the world. I really love that idea of cooperating with the truth. In, in your journey to do that, what was the lesson that took you the longest to learn? I think the longest, and I would say the hardest, is the paradox that all things are true. All things aren't fair or just, but all things are true. And, and I can share the moment that that opened to me very powerfully. Um, and, uh, but before I do that, let me say that, so, you know, in, and this is the difference between the mind and the heart, the mind, which is a great problem solving tool, but the mind is great at sorting, prioritizing and choosing. Well, that works great out here in the, in the world of circumstance, but everything that's helped me be alive has come from absorbing and integrating, which is how the heart works. And holding on things, even if they don't make sense, and this leads to the world of paradox, until the heart releases a deeper logic of the spirit. So uh, now to my personal example. So when I was in my cancer journey, 
and I had had part another surgery that I had this rib removed from my back. And a few weeks after it, I was uh, to start a very aggressive chemo uh, treatment. And I did that in New York City out of Columbia Presbyterian Hospital because they, I had a rare form of cancer and they were great detectives with cancer, but they were, it turned out they were not great caregivers. So I was given my first treatment. I, my former wife and a dear old friend of mine accompanied me. And then we stayed in a Holiday Inn near, in Queens somewhere near, near the city. And unfortunately, the only uh, medicine I was given in case I, I got nauseous from the treatment was oral. So I couldn't keep it down. And I had just had a rib removed from my back two weeks earlier. So I even still had the stitches in. So every, t- every 20 minutes, I started getting sick. And not only was that, but, you know, that would, it hurt a great deal. And, you know, we kept thinking, this can't go on. It must stop. And, of course, it didn't. And then eventually, by the early, uh, by dawn, we went to the emergency room. But during that difficult time, and not through any wisdom on my part, I was afraid. I didn't know where this was going. I didn't know what was going to happen next. But as the sun started to come out and I was sitting with my elbows on my knees on the floor of this Holiday Inn, I started to realize that somewhere nearby a baby was being born. And even though I was hurting, somewhere nearby a couple was making love for the first time. And somewhere nearby uh, an old parent and a grown adult child were uh, who hadn't talked for years, were finally sitting and talking to each other. And so I was forced to feel that all things are true and that to be broken is no reason to see all things as broken. And so that was the revelation. But working with it and reflecting on it for years since, almost 40 years since then, has led me to understand that while when I'm broken, I need the company of someone who knows what it's like to feel broken, I need everything whole to heal. And while when I'm afraid, I need the company of someone who knows what it's like to be afraid, I need everything safe to heal. And so one of the things that's very natural is, as human beings, when we go through something, we extrapolate it into a world view. If I'm broken, I think the world's a broken place. If I'm afraid, the world's not a safe place. Or we go the other way. We say, oh, well, if all the rest of that's happening, then what's happening to me is not important. No, it's real. All things are true. And it's this greater diversity. You know, we often talk rightfully about ethnic diversity. But in terms of life, the unity of life is the greatest diversity, and that unto itself is healing. So I need to honor what I'm going through and be open to everything that thankfully is not what I'm going through. How do, how do I stay open to that? You know, you know the, <clears throat> the famous song by Le, um, Leonard Cohen, Hallelujah. Well, I do a whole kind of session on that because I think what he's talking about when he talks about the broken hallelujah is, has something to do with this, that um, while, while we go through difficult things, life is still whole and healing. So a good an example is if you and I are on a raft at sea and a wave comes and smashes the raft, well, that's not a good day for you and me. And it doesn't diminish the majesty of the sea. And the broken hallelujah is how do we hold both in our heart? How do we hold that all things are true? Another example is the great Spanish poet Garcia Lorca. Now he has this very stark image in one of his poems. He says, who in holding a newborn child cannot also imagine the skull of a dead horse? Now, his friend said, hey, Garcia, lighten up, you know, whoa, what are you? (laughs) But I think what he was getting at is everything, you know, this is what the deepest traditions speak about, that 
everything is coming together and everything is falling apart. Everything, you know, Dylan had, Bob Dylan had that, everything is busy being born and busy dying. And, you know, we suffer from, uh, we go back to that entitled happiness. When we resist the true wholeness of life, we resist its resources. And so there is a suffering that comes from resisting suffering. Carl Jung said that the neurosis is a substitute for legitimate suffering. So we make things worse. You know, the best thing we can do, if you're in pain, the best thing that you can do is acknowledge it, and then I can help you as your loved one. And I will learn, we will learn from it together. But if we keep it bottled up and try to run from it, we double the pain. So this is not, you know, a downer. This is the courage to face the entirety of this mystery we call life. And what do, how, do we, how do we be a spirit in a body and time on earth? and be loving and kind. I just really heard that, Mark. Thank you. I think a lot of others did too. You know, you, you mentioned that that match strike for you was having cancer. And since that time, you know, as I was introducing you, I've talked about 25 books, you know, number one New York Times bestseller, reaching millions of people around the world. Your work highlights leaving a lasting legacy and you encourage others to do the same. How do people make sense of this idea of legacy? What steps can they take? Well, so let's, let's, um, let's back up and talk about what legacy means. So I, th I think that, you know, when we trip into the illusion that we can write our own movie and we think we can control and you know, I'm going to be a great president, or I'm going to be this, or I'm going to be that, and I'm going to make sure that my name is on a building. No, that, that's, that's an entire uh, distraction of a life. So if we go back to the sense that our purpose is to be as alive as possible and as giving as possible, well, then our job is to hold nothing back, emanate light and love, and then maybe, like star, you know how stars, when they go out, their light continues for centuries. That's our legacy. Our legacy is the unnamed uh, light and love that comes from us without agenda, without pinpointing through a five-year or 20-year plan. So how do we do that? So the couple of things around, uh, around faith, and I don't mean faith in, I mean faith in life, not faith in a doctrine or a saint or a sage. So, so two definitions are really helpful here. One is the Protestant theologian Paul Tillich, and he defined faith as any act of ultimate concern. I love that. Any act of ultimate concern, that when we give completely, holding nothing back to what is needed, we generate that light from our star. And we assure the connections in the world and between us and within us. And the other is the Buddhist word for faith, sadha. S-A-D-D-H-A -D -D is the English phoneta phonetic rendering of that. And I love this too. It means resting the heart in what is true. Isn't that beautiful? So this, this gives us, so both of those to me give us, a, what the, resting the heart in what is true is how we live faith inwardly. Any act of ultimate concern is how we live faith and love outwardly. And the heart is what connects it. So, you know, I discovered from a, a physician who was in one of my, uh, my groups that the, in the fetus, when we're being formed, literally the heart is the first thing that forms. 
And the next thing are the arms. The arms start to grow out of the heart and the little, they almost look like red wings. They're called arm buds. So the way that we build a legacy every day is by being authentic because the word authentic comes from the Greek word authentis and it means the mark of the hands. So building a legacy in a daily way comes from taking what starts in the heart and having it come out of our hands. This is why when we're passionate, we talk with our hands because there's a direct connection with the heart and the hand. This is why a sign of a heart attack is you feel it in your arm. This is also a very uh, functional definition of integrity. When what starts in the heart can come out of the hands. And if we do that as a way of life, then like stars that go out, our light will continue f for centuries. I love that idea. When the star goes out and the light just continues on, no agenda, just continues on for centuries. And that legacy is... is you know, the opportunity of legacy is the opportunity of authenticity in this moment. So legacy, legacy is the result of a heart-filled, well-lived life, not the plan to be important. If you think about Mark earlier in your journey, hadn't, in, hadn't had the, the, the journey that you've had since that time, the 20-year-old Mark, what advice would you give yourself at that time in your life? Yeah, that's a, I, a wonderful question. And uh, let me give you a, a moment that I tripped into that. And uh, recently I was teaching in Italy um, last May. And we were part of the journey. We were in Florence. Now, when I first, uh, one of my early books um, involved the Sistine Chapel in my land. And so when I was like in my late 20s, um, I actually went over to Italy and I spent time in Florence by myself as a young man and um, writing. And, and it was during that trip that I discovered I had a tumor on my skull. Now, I haven't been back in all these years. And so I was with my wife, who we, I didn't know her then. But we were standing on this bridge, the Ponte Vecchio, uh, and I saw the place where I, on the bank where I stayed as a young man. And I had this very kind of reverberation, this feeling like here I am, 72. And I stood here when I was like 28. And the arc of that was quite profound, even though I couldn't put it all into words. But I think one of the things that I would have uh, said to my younger self well, would be... Um, Keep following your heart. Your heart is your greatest teacher and your strongest muscle. And um, listen to what people feel, not what they think. Wow. Listen to what people feel, not what they think. Wow. You've been writing for decades. You're 72 years old. As you said, the work continues, the work goes on. You know, you've been, you've been shaping your life and other lives through this journey, this, this opportunity to explore transformation with others. What do you see as next for you? Oh, I, I've, I've got, so, you know, this is so interesting because, I mean, one of the reasons I've been blessed to be prolific is I've learned how to get out of the way. Like, you know, about a couple of decades ago, writing term became listening and taking notes. Of course, it involves all of me, but but yeah, when I got out of the way, and so you know, my father, who was a master woodworker, and he's gone now about ten years, but I've realized amazingly after all these years, he he had a bench in his basement, and there were five or six vices, you know, and he had a project in every one of them. And he would like, I, he never talked about it, but I remember watching him as a kid and he would glue one thing and then he'd go over and chisel another and then he'd sand another. 
Well, it never occurred to me till till only recently that that's how I work on books. I always work on more than one at the same time. They they cross pollinate, and then one will take over, and I'll see it to the end. So I have several books um, in pro- in process uh, right now. And what's interesting is that they, uh, you know, looking back, there is a, a, a there, there's a sense to my work. The, but going forward, I didn't, you know, like if you look, the Book of Awakening was about being awake. Then there was the exquisite risk. Well, I once awake, I needed to know how to take risks. And then there was finding inner courage. Once taking risks, I and and surviving cancer, even though people said I was courageous, you know how that is. People, yeah, people say you're courageous. And you go, well, I just did what I had to do, you know. Um, well, then I ran out of all I knew about courage. I needed to learn about courage. And then came 7,000 ways to listen. It After being present and taking risks and being courageous, there's, you just have to stop and listen. So, you know, looking at all, there is some kind of organic order to the discovery over a lifetime. And so actually now I have a book coming out this year on uh, French spirit and friendship. And in 2025, I, I, I will have a book coming out on the second half of life. And so I have several books. And then also, you know, my poetry, which is the source of it all, um, that just keeps accumulating. And, and, and I think the thing to share mostly here is that I don't write to share what I know. I write and discover what I didn't know I knew I know. So it's more like retrieving. I'm not channeling, but I'm cooperating with truth. I'm retrieving books more than authoring them. And it's a continued conversation with the mystery of life. And, and so like, for instance, a poem, when I write a poem, it's not that I, oh, here's an image that would be a great ending. No, 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 no. If I'm, and this is why the creative process is so important to share as the introspective process. Because if I am true to whatever it is, a pain, a fear, a confusion, a wonder, a beauty, a, a tenderness, and I express that I am often rewarded with an insight or a teaching. So I discover where these things go, and then they have to be my teacher. So I think the other thing that I would offer anyone whatever their age, is whenever struggling to give your full heart's attention to the nearest piece of life before you until it becomes your teacher. It could be a fly on a window. The Hindu expression upa guru means the teacher that's next to you at this moment there's always a teacher next to us at this moment if we put down the the you know often our plans are like screens on windows they prevent us from seeing clearly and from opening the window i found this conversation today so wonderful and important. And I really appreciate your time with us today. Oh, thank you. A joy to journey here together. Thank you so much.